want you to imagine, I want you to imagine, if you will, I want you to close your eyes and imagine the dark vastness of space. Not a single thing in space, but only the darkness without the sun. And one day God the Father says, and remember, the Holy Spirit was hovering on the face of the deep. And we forget so much to include him in the Godhead bodily. It was a trifecta that came together when God said, you know what, guys? I want to make a new creation. Let's call him man. And they all agreed. And they said, let's let them have the dominion over everything that we create. Over dominion of things they have not even seen yet. Let's blow their mind and make all this creation before they're even made. We were the last creation made because God wanted to show out. God wanted to say, look, this is my gifts to you. Look at all these things. I want you to name them. I want you to take dominion over them. Look at the beautiful, bountiful trees I've made. Look at the fowls of the air. Look at the fruits in the trees. I made this all for you. Because you can never outgive me. I am the greatest gift giver that has ever been. That's what Christmas is all about. When God created us, He gave us the most amazing gift that He could possibly give. And what was that? Life. And to live it in full. And not only did the master, the creator, the complete, you can't even put him into words. There's no words to describe how incredibly unique our God is. Not only did he create us, but he took the time and the energy to use his own hands to mold something from the dust of the earth and to call it man. And then he breathed the pneuma, which was his life essence, his very life essence into us. And we became a living being. So as God gave a gift from heaven, it was our job to be the gift to the earth. It was our job to dress the earth. It was our job to call things that be not as though they were. We were going to be the gift to the earth. But God gave us a free choice. Because he is the ultimate gift giver. He wanted us to love him because of our great adoration towards him. That's why he allowed us to have that free will. And even though Jesus was not actually born on December 25th, and he was most likely born two months prior to that, we can be thankful that God has given us a day to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. What gift did Jesus give us? After we chose poorly, and after we had the free will to choose, but we can't choose the consequences of our choices. 
The enemy came in like a flood and usurped all of that authority that Adam and Eve had. They had access to everything good in the Garden of Eden. They were there to freely enjoy lavish, abundant life. And God made it so. But God had to put something in that garden to make sure that we loved him more than anything else. And when that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the garden, and he told Adam not to eat from the tree that you would surely die. Death was something foreign. It did not exist. God did not design man to grow old and die. God calls death the enemy. Death will have no sting. There will be no victory in death one day. Because the gift giver is going to make good on his promise. And he's going to swallow up death in an instant. And there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more weeping. There will be no more mourning. Also be is the presence of the Lord day and night. Joy, peace, goodness, kindness, meekness, patience. All the beautiful things that God had planned for us at the very beginning of life. But Satan, he was an alt law spirit. And he had no jurisdiction at that time. Therefore, Satan possessed the body of a serpent and tempted Adam and Eve. And as the Bible says, they did eat and they knew, they knew who they were after that. When Adam and Eve fell, death came into the world. And man bowed down his knee to Satan. And God reluctantly had to give the earth that man had the dominion over. He had to give it to Satan. But you have to understand one thing. When you follow God, you will always win. You are on the winning team. Even though it may look bleak, even though darkness may be pressing their corners all around you, even though people may be speaking negative things about you, they may be cursing you behind your back, cursing you to your face. But Satan can never beat God. Remember that when you feel defeated or broken or tired or hurt or worn out, Satan can never beat God. Before the earth was created, Lucifer rebelled against God and was cast down to where the earth is, and he was banished. Lucifer was very jealous because the earth was his domain before he fell. And now God created man to dwell in his domain. God told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Because as God gave gifts to man, God wanted men to give gifts to other people. To keep the gifts moving. When we procreate, we are saying to God, we are giving a gift back to you. Use our daughters, use our sons for your kingdom. There's no greater thing that you can give to your creator than your son, your daughter. In yourself. It's all about a circular giving 
God gives, we give, they give. God gives, we give, they give. That's what God wanted. And had we followed that design pattern, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. So the earth was once plenished, but God said, replenish the earth. So Lucifer and his angels once dwelled on earth where we were before we were created. This is still his dominion, folks. That's why there's so much evil in the world. Because he is considered the prince and the power of the air. And that's why so many people are against God. That's why you can talk about Muhammad, you can talk about Confucius, you can talk about Buddhism, you can talk about yoga, you can talk about any other thing, but the minute you bring up Jesus Christ, it's an offense to 98% of the world. Why? Because Lucifer has whispered the lie that he whispered into Adam and Eve, into all those other people. And they are living under the curse that Adam brought on them. They are living under the curse that Eve brought upon them. Hmm. But here's what I love. Once again, God's saying, Merry Christmas. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15. Once again, God giving a gift to mankind to redeem us from the fall. That's how much our God loves us. Jesus, the only one who can choose where to be born. Jesus, either in a, pal a palace or in a humble manger. He could have chose. He could have chose where he wanted to go. He could have said, Father, I want to be born in a palace. I want to have regalia all around me. I want people to know that I am your son. But he didn't choose that, did he? He came lowly. He came as a servant. The infinite became the finite in a body, in the body of a boy. He could have said, you know what? Forget it, man. They've already blown it, Father. Start over. We don't have to put up with this. But Jesus was an ultimate gift giver too. And he said, Father, I want them to have what I have. I want them to partake of what you've given me. So I am willing to go down and lose my kingdomly estate for 33 and a half years and to be tempted the way that they're tempted, to be mocked the way they're mocked, to be ridiculed the way they're ridiculed, to be scorned the way they're scorned, to be beaten the way they're beaten, to be scourged the way they're scourged. Now, if that's not love, I don't know what is. If that's not the greatest Christmas gift that we could ever receive as mankind, 
Please tell me another. But see, Satan kept trying to prevent Jesus' birth. Under the law, a sinner would bring an unblemished lamb to the temple. The sinner's sinfulness would be transferred to the lamb upon the laying on of hands, upon the lamb's head. And on the other hand, the lamb's righteousness was transferred to the sinner, and he walked away righteous before God. But that was not true payment. That was a payment by credit. The redemption and the purchase wasn't done yet. The true payment was only paid when the blood poured. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remissions. There's no remission of sin. So I sit here and I marvel at the selflessness of the Godhead. I marvel at it. And when we look at the Holy Spirit, he's all powerful. He's omnipotent. He comes as a gentle spirit. He never condemns. He's always kind and loving. That's who we have. The most incredible gift givers that you could ever want to know. And I'm thankful for his gifts. I'm thankful for his unmerciful, undeserved, and undying love that he has for each and every one of us. When he looks at you, he sees Jesus. When he looks at me, he sees Jesus. He's not impartial. He loves every one of us. It's time for us to start loving ourselves the way God sees us instead of the way that we see us. Because the way that God sees us, he sees us with victory in our hands. He sees the battle already won. Hmm. So God says, mm, God says, he will not condemn us any more by the letter of the law. Because I sent my gift. And all you got to do is receive it. Receive his payment in full. And I will vindicate you and drop the charges. Every one of us have been vindicated by the blood of Christ. Completely set free from all debt that we could never pay. Jesus the creator of all beings who holds creation all together was held in the arms of a virgin woman as a vulnerable baby. Can you grasp that concept? Jesus, I'm going to repeat that, the creator of all beings who holds all creation together was held in the arms of a virgin woman and was a vulnerable baby. God did not send Jesus to teach men morals or commandments. He sent Jesus to be a savior, 
not a judge or a lawgiver. That was not his role at the time. His role at the time was saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one cometh to the Father but by me. Because he wanted everyone to receive the gift. And he still to this day wants everyone to receive that gift. When it was time for Mary to give birth, it says in the Bible, there was no place for them to stay. There was no room in the inn. There was no room for comfort. So where did Jesus have to go? He rested in a stony manger where the animals lived, where the slop and the stench lived. Not even able to be born with humans. Pulled aside and set apart in a stinking animal manger. Where you wouldn't send your best friend to stay the night. Would you send your best friend? If you invited your best friend and there wasn't enough room, would you say, go sleep in my garage? No. That's how much Jesus loved you. That he was willing to even do that. Did you know? Do your own research. The inn was actually David's house. An inheritance of his. And he didn't even get to stay in his own flesh and blood family's house. Did not Jesus come from the line of Jesse? The son of David will be born he was not even allowed to stay in his rightful inheritance because there was no room in the inn. Mary and Joseph's ancestry can be traced back to David. They unknowingly went back to their ancestral home. Mary placing baby Jesus and a stony manger signifies that Jesus was born to die. Jesus went from a virgin womb to a virgin tomb. He was laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. It was a last minute arrangement. No one had been laid in that tomb before. It was brand new. It was supposed to be for Joseph when he died. And Joseph was a rich person from the Sanhedrin that understood who Jesus was. And out of his mercy and his kindness, gave up his burial plot to Jesus. So he went from the virgin womb to the virgin tomb. What's the greatest gift that mankind has? What do you think it is? It's the blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. God's angels can take on human forms. The fallen angels cohabited with human women and women gave birth to giants. Satan instigated the fallen angels to do that because he wanted to stop the prophesied seed from coming. If he could ruin the bloodlines, Jesus 
could not be born. Only Noah and his ham, only Noah and his family had the pure human blood and the DNA left. So you can see from the very beginning that God, his ultimate purpose was to redeem mankind, the greatest gift that could ever be given, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So God had to bring a flood of judgment to destroy all living things to preserve the pure human stock of Noah's family. You ever think, what if he wouldn't have brought the flood in? Would Noah's lineage, would his heritage, would his bloodline, would it have remained pure? God knew exactly the time and the place and what he had to do and when he had to do it in order to secure the prophesied seed from coming in. And no matter what the devil tried to do, he'd fail. And then he tried one more time with Herod. Herod went out trying to kill all the babies that were under two years old. But when is he going to learn? When is Satan going to learn? He cannot outplay God. God is always 10 steps ahead of him. So what did he do? He sent an angel of the Lord to wake up Joseph and said, you need to get the baby and Mary to Egypt. That's how much, that's how much he loved us. Jesus was the only one born a king. Royal sons are usually born of princes. The first question that he ever asked man in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, where are you? He said that to Adam, where are you? Now let's move 2000 years into the future. The very first question in the New Testament was where is he? born king of the Jews in the gospel of Matthew. God was closing the circle. Where are you was from the attitude in the place of sin at the fall, right? Where is he born king of the Jews is the restoration from the fall. Looking for the restorer and the rep and the repairer of the breach, Jesus Christ. Five times the passage says, the child in his mother, not the mother in her child. Look it up. Matthew 2, verses 3 through 12. As a child, Jesus is born. That's his humanity. As a son is given, since he has always existed, that's his deity. Are we learning? Do we see how amazing our God is? How can we not? want to share that gift with everybody that we meet. 
How can we not want to share the blood of Christ with all of his creation? God has given us such an outstanding gift that I urge you and I challenge you for 2023, spread his gift to everybody you know. Amen. And lastly, On the cross, Jesus took our sins and God laid them upon Jesus. God laid them on a perfect vessel that never knew sin. That's how much he loved us. And Jesus' body hung there for hours, being punished from the things that we did. Undeservingly. We are not washed by our good works, our morality, or by our own blood. It's only Jesus' blood that can wash us from our sins. Jesus is the only one who could choose, again, where to be born, either in a palace or in a humble manger. And he removed his royalty. He removed his regalia. The infinite became finite in the body of a boy. Jesus paid for all our sins as believers. And because of that promise, we can expect blessings ahead of us. There is no more punishment in our future. If we can position ourselves to understand the gift giver, then we likewise can also become a gift giver and bring Jesus his rightful place in the earth and not be ashamed of the gospel. And in closing, I say this, if you are ashamed of me before men, I shall be ashamed of you before my heavenly father. There's no reason why we should ever be ashamed. We should be shouting to the rooftops because the blood of Jesus has restored what man failed to do. And that is the best Christmas present we could ever receive. Yeah. Amen. First course done. <laughs> God is good. Let's let's throw up some praise hands and say thank you for the greatest <laughs> gift, right? Thank you for the greatest gift. All right. So we go from we go from the word, right? He says, I am the bread of life. Now we're going to drink in, we're going to drink in some worship. Some Holy Spirit, right? Some new oil. We're going to have a couple songs in between, and then Karen's going to bring the second course. It's amazing because uh, Jonathan and I don't ever know what each other are going to talk about, and it's amazing how <laughs> God operates. So we're going to sh share my screen. So Jonathan, just let me know because I have to do something a little bit different than. Uh, how do I do this? I pray that there's at least one. There's at least one that it will benefit from what I'm sharing. Because let's be honest, there are times that we go and we listen to messages and they don't inspire you or they don't speak to you for whatever reason. 
It may be because the points of the message you can't relate to because you have not experienced those things in your life. Or maybe that you haven't experienced a certain amount of pain in the way that others have. The holidays tend to produce some anxiety and some fear for people. And a lot of it's because it's that they're revisiting pain from the past. And so if you have lived on this planet, this is one of my favorite sayings. That I if you have lived on this planet any amount of time, you have experienced pain. You most certainly have been bruised. If not, beaten and battered. But you know pain. The thing of it is, is when we have memories and we start to review the things of the past, is that you do bring up painful memories. And a lot of times when you start to think about it, the symptoms of pain are sadness, bitterness, loneliness, fear. But when you really drill down, when you really drill down to what pain is, you can identify it at the root for love being disappointed, right? Love being disappointed or hope being disappointed. And we have all experienced it. And there's not one of us that has escaped pain's grip. Not even Jesus, for he experienced it the most. Because he not only experienced his own pain, but he experienced my pain, and he experienced your pain, each and every one of you. And not only that, but he experienced the pain of the entire world. The entire world, all the people of all past generations, all people that are living now, and all people that will live. When he hung on that cross, he accepted all of the pain, all of the rejection, all of the mocking and the searing and everything that could possibly come upon you that Satan would throw at you and all of the sin that you had entered into and participated in partook of, he took it all. He took it all. He knows pain. Amen. He endured the wrath of God. And the word declares in Isaiah 53 verse 10, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him to suffer. And through the Lord make his life an offering for our sin. He will see the will of his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Let's understand pain in this world is inevitable. It is a part of life. If Jesus endured it, you will endure it too. Amen. I know this it doesn't sound like a Christmas message. And it's not the typical message that you'll hear in church because they want to flower it up and make it pretty. But the cross was not pretty, y'all. It was pain. It was pain. And it was not his. It was not even justified for him. It was ours. If he had to endure it, then we have to do it as well. But how many are crushed in a, this holiday season? We mask it throughout the months. We put on a smiley face. But there's just something about Christmas and the holiday season that brings out the brokenness and the sadness in many. Because that love was disappointed and hope was diverted. And they can't help but look back and review the lost opportunities, the separation and the isolation that they feel, and that hope deferred. Even the word declares in Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Amen. There is a story worth knowing, and there is a story worth living about a longing 
fulfilled, who literally is the tree of life. Amen. As God had been separated from humanity, the Lord stepped in. The word declares in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Jesus came to this earth at the request of the Father because there was that separation due to Adam. There was that separation between him and his creation that he was longing for. And the Father requested, and Jesus said, send me. I'll go. Send me. So let's turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read uh, starting at verse 7. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you, and you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those of whom his favor rests. Amen. Love no longer disappointed because of Jesus. Hope no longer deferred because Jesus has come to make the way to restore and to reconcile the lost and the separation between God and his creation, his children. Amen. He made a place before the throne. The veil was rent and no longer separation, but we were invited into the throne room of grace. God himself beckoning us his creation, to come and sit and let's reason together. The blood of Jesus Christ has made a way. Amen. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. And we're going to read, we're going to read a bit. So Ephesians chapter 3. Starting at verse 1. And this is Paul talking. Amen. Listen to the words that Paul chooses. And don't for one minute think that these words were not purposeful. They were written by the Holy Spirit. Knowing that one day we would all be together. and We would be reading this. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for the sake of Gentiles, you Gentiles, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations. As it has now been revealed by the spirit of God, the holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs. We are co-heirs with Christ. Together with Israel, 
members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Jesus Christ. I became a servant of the gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of God's power. Although I am less than the least of the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless richness of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in him and through faith. In him, we may approach God. We may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with a power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, how long, and how high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God's grace to you and me, a way has been made that we are co-heirs with Christ. Amen. Members together in one body and sharers together in the promise of Jesus. The promise, Jesus, the gift through God's grace, the boundless riches of Christ, according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished through Christ and in him through faith, and that in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. It was the plan all along. God planned Jesus Christ. He knew the sacrifice that would be made. And Jesus knew what he was doing when he took it. And he came anyway. The greatest gift ever given this world. And more so, the gift of the veil being rent and our ability to approach freely and confidently. I kneel before the Father from whom every family derives its name. Y'all, I was listening to a, 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 a teaching where they have broken down the DNA. And the way that the DNA is broken down in the numbers and the, and the weight of the strands, in the old Hebrew Sanskrit, it comes out, it's actually spelled in your DNA, God eternal. God eternal. Science now coming together to, to confirm that there is a God. So when he says that the Father from every family derives its name in your DNA, it says God is eternal. 
God has labeled you. You are his. Amen. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. You being rooted together and established in love may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, that he would leave his throne and come down as a boy, be born of a virgin amongst the animals in a manger. He left everything that he had for you and me because love compelled him to do so. Love compelled him to do that. To grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge Everything that you think you could possibly ever know can't even but scratch the surface of what his love did for you. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God and to God be the glory. The most extravagant gift of love ever given to the world was the gift of Jesus, and through Jesus, the gift of the access to God in the throne room of grace, in which we cry out, Abba, Father, no longer is love disappointed, no longer is hope deferred. Our Redeemer lives, and his name is Savior Bread of life, Lord, creator, son of God, holy one of Israel, king of kings, and Lord of lords, the almighty, the master, king of the Jews, high priest, teacher, Emmanuel, advocate, chief cornerstone, Lamb of God, the Good Shepherd, the Fountain of Living Water, the Messiah, the True Vine, the Bridegroom, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, Amen, (laughs) the Bright and Morning Star, Son of Man, He is the Way the truth, and the life forevermore. Have you ever had someone say to you, just in general conversation or a passing, hey, what was your favorite Christmas gift ever? And you stop and you search and you think your mind, like, oh my gosh, what good things did I get? What good things did I get? Jesus Christ was the best gift ever given this world. Jesus Christ is the best gift that God has ever given you purposefully. The best gift came to your heart in a personal way and said, here am I. If you come with me and I dwell in you and you dwell in me, amen, because his blood made the way. His blood made a way, the most perfect gift, the most extravagant love ever delivered to this world was delivered through a virgin, and it was a baby boy placed in the manger, but yet made to rule the world forever and ever and ever. Amen. The best gift ever. 
The question is, this gift was freely given. What are you doing with the gift that was given you? What are you doing with the gift? The extravagant love that was just put right to you. Are you doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord that sacrificed everything for you? Have you opened up your heart wide and said, come on in, King of glory, and sit upon the throne of my heart? Come, teach me that I might learn your ways, that just as following your example, as you came in, you went out, come into my heart and I'll go out. Will you say to him, Yes, Father, send me, I'll go. What are you doing with the gift given you? Because it's yours to do with whatever you want with it. Amen. Use him wisely. Open your heart. Fling open those doors of your spirit. Welcome the King of Glory into your heart and start to move and start to renew yourself. In this season, we know the hour is late. Have you shared your gift? You know, the thing of it is, is you will hear from millionaires, rich people, that they have everything, but they still have no peace. Because you want to know why they hoard everything. But when you start to take what's in here and push it out and give it away and give it away and give it away, you become alive and you have purpose. And so it is with Jesus. You can keep him in your heart and you're still going to be saved and you're still going to go to heaven. You can keep him there. But that's not what the plan was. The plan was that you would receive him and that you would share him. And that you would speak of him and that you would talk about him and you would share this amazing gift that you were given with everybody else. Amen. The best gift ever given to the world was the extravagant love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Glory is inside of you, each and every one of you. Each and every one of you is in the same position that Mary was. But Mary had it physically. We were all gifted it spiritually. And it is upon us, it is upon us to remain in him and him and us. Because that is the greatest gift that continues to give powerful words from our Father. I said we would have a meal that we would not forget. Two courses. Two courses to give us the greatest gift Two courses to remind us that it was his plan all along. Two courses to show us our importance to him. Amen. Turn on your videos, you guys. Come to the life. I just, I want to be obedient. To the spirit of the Lord. God wants to do something tonight. Yes. He wants to release blessings. On everyone here. Amen. He wants to show you. What an amazing. Gift giver. He is. Amen. And that's why Eric is being led 
to have everybody come to their camera right now. Because the Lord told me, have them come to their cameras. And I just want to listen and be obedient to the Lord. I don't want you guys to miss out on what he wants to do tonight. He wants to change your mornings into happiness. He wants to take away your pain and replace it with peace. He wants to take away your anger and replace it with happiness. He wants to take away your doubt and turn it into belief. These are the gifts the Lord God wants to open tonight for each and every one of you. 